What is socialism and why does it fail? Part 1. The Theory Socialism is a range of political, social, and economic theories characterized by the production and redistributions of goods being controlled collectively. Socialism also means the egalitarian or equal redistribution of wealth through the collective ownership of the means of production. The means of production is referring to the land, labor, and capital needed to produce goods and services, also called consumer goods. Socialists typically use the phrase worker control of the means of production, meaning that the workers will be in control of the land, labor, and capital needed to produce consumer goods. Socialists argue that the workers should receive everything that they produce from their work rather than just a small portion. They believe that the capitalists and business owners are confiscating the wealth generated by the workers' labor to serve only their interests, that profit is nothing more than theft and exploitation. In theory, this sounds great. Workers receive full value for their work and they can democratically decide how to run a business, making it beneficial for everyone, not just the owner. However, these advocates of the work and control of the means of production fundamentally misunderstand human behavior and economics. There are a few reasons why it is not only impractical to give workers control over the means of production, but also unethical. First of all, the reason why the business was created in the first place was the profit incentive. The entrepreneur, when starting the business, didn't create it out of sheer willpower to help the people. He created it because he thought that he had a chance of making profit. If the entrepreneur could somehow predict the future and knew that he was going to lose money for sustaining and creating the business, he would never start it. People naturally want to do things out of their own self-interest, which they want to gain something from doing an action, even if it's not a monetary gain. Think about it. Why would you plant 100 seeds to harvest 50? No, you plant 100 seeds to harvest 1,000. And every action, regardless of it is starting a business, voluntarily working for someone else, voluntarily exchanging property, planting seeds to harvest food, or any other activity or action done by humans, it is done for gain for profit. The entrepreneur risked wealth to start a business, provided other people with jobs at his own expense and created a good or service which people might want or not. If the business fails at selling the product, the entrepreneur is the one who loses his money he invested in the business and he could possibly go bankrupt. The people who work for the business on the other hand, their savings are unaffected because they did not invest into the business. This is a primary reason why the workers don't have the right to own the business. They did not spend the money to start and organize it. They are not the ones who created jobs for other people, and they are not the providers of a product for consumers. The capital goods which are used to make consumer goods, such as machinery, equipment, vehicles, tools, and other devices and instruments, are provided by the owner of a business or company for the workers to use. The workers only deserve their voluntarily agreed upon wage, as this is the real value of their work, which is determined by market forces such as supply and demand. As explained in my last video, profit is not exploitation, workers are not being exploited and profit is not the money stolen from the value of their labor. Instead, profit is a reward for creating value and supplying the needs of the consumers. In addition, profit can also be used to expand your business to create more jobs for workers which will fulfill their own needs and mass produce even more products, further increasing supply and reducing costs. Hiring people for work is not exploitation due to being voluntarily, voluntary, meaning that they agree to work for you. The reason for, for the process happening is the subjective theory of value, which assumes that both sides benefit from the arrangement. So now, it, so now it has been established why the entrepreneur makes profits and why he deserves to keep them. The socialists also typically define workers as the ones who are purely unskilled, make low wages, and the ones who are quote-unquote the most oppressed, meaning the ones whose work is not very valuable because it is common and easy to find people with similar attributes as theirs. Anyone can be a worker under capitalism. The only reason the entrepreneur even has the money to invest in a business is due to his parents, grandparents, or another member of his family working to achieve the level of wealth which the entrepreneur inherited. However, socialism isn't all that simple. It isn't just the worker control of the means of production. It is far more than that. Another element of so another key element of socialism is the e is the equal redistribution of wealth and capital. 
and that everyone will receive what they need according to their abilities. This is based off Marx's quote, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. According to socialists, this will make the society more equal and fair, as everyone will receive what they need to live, along with working to produce things which everyone needs. Firstly, this is completely impossible due to human behavior. As I explained already, people do things because they have an incentive to, and that incentive in a market economy is profit, regardless of it being an, an investment or a wage. Under socialism, this incentive doesn't exist, as everyone gets the same thing, no matter how much or how little you work. Under Marx's theoretical higher stage of communism, there is no price for goods and services. That means that everyone can just freely get them. Without prices, there would be no way to dictate the supply and demand for a product, making it impossible to have incentives for production to know how much of something is going to be produced. Marx assumes that people will be responsible and work for the benefit of everyone, even without incentives. Be honest, if you had the opportunity to get something for free and not work, most people will take this opportunity. The higher stage of communism could be described as people taking without producing until there's nothing left to take, resulting in the complete destruction and ca resulting in the complete destruction of society. Marx believed that human nature could be changed depending on the environment. However, this is a flat out lie. Certain behaviors are ingrained in us because this is the way to preserve and spread our genes for us to expand as a species. Now, moving on to a more realistic example of equal redistribution of wealth. Let's just say that people that the people choose, using the monopolistic and total power of the state, to equally redistribute Elon Musk's wealth, the richest person in the world. The net worth of Elon Musk is $215 billion, and the population of the United States of America is, is 334 million people. If we evenly divide Elon Musk's wealth, all Americans would gain $643.71. That is a very small amount of money, which a person can do almost nothing with. However, there will be an economic regression caused by stealing and redistributing Elon Musk's hard-earned wealth and destroying the businesses he owns. Elon Musk currently employs 110,000 people, and all of those people will be left unemployed, and the goods and services they work to produce would be halted. This means that all of Musk's developments, the Tesla, the Falcon rocket, the Hyperloop, PayPal e-payments, and many other products that improve people's lives would cease to exist in the market. In addition, Musk's profits and accumulated wealth could have been used to create more jobs, produce more innovative products which improves the lives of the consumer, donate to charity to assist the poor, and invest for future production and consumption. We can clearly see how the cost of redistribution vastly exceeds the benefits. Redistribution, the redistribution of wealth is robbery on a grand scale. The state steals money from an individual who earned it and gives it to someone who had nothing to do with the wealth he was given. The redistribution of wealth discourages innovation, production, creation, and growth, and encourages laziness and abusing the system to live off someone else's wealth without working a day in your life. The redistribution of wealth discourages enterprise because you don't keep the fruits of your own labor. Before moving on to the subject of private property, I will discuss collectivism and individualism, and how equality can only be enforced using collectivism. Socialism advocates for equality, meaning that people should receive the same thing for the same type of work. Socialism is also when people have equal access to goods and capital, meaning that everyone would essentially have the same thing. This is ludicrous, as every individual has distinct goals, desires, skills, attributes, demands, values, preferences, and many, many, many other differences. It is natural that people have different outcomes, even if you have the same job. Because you make different decisions of your money and you may work harder, you make more money and save money more efficiently. In e even in theory, you are... In theory, you are twins with a person working at the same job and working the exact same amount. You still may be paid differently due to how much a boss values your work, or a business owner rather. Since value is subjective, different people may value the same thing more or less depending on their, on their personal preferences. Before moving on to the subject, as opposed to collectivism, only the individual should be able to decide what to do with their own life and should not be forced to serve the ends of the collective. A collective cannot act. A collective is not an entity. 
only the individual acts. And even if he's within a collective, only the individual acts. The only way to possibly benefit the community or society in a meaningful way is to let the individual freely act to achieve his own self-interest. This will make the individuals richer, happier, and will lead to a more prosperous society. Not forcing people to work for the benefit of people with power and authority over, over a community or collective. The final and most important element of socialism is the abolition of private property. Some socialists do indeed make the distinction between personal and private property. For them, personal property means material goods that one is currently using for personal consumption and private property is material goods that one is not cur that one is currently using for wealth production and they consider it differently be because one for them is ethical whereas the other one isn't and it's a completely an arbitrary difference in practice however in practice personal property and private property are the same thing personal property such as food water clothes and a home and private property, such as factories, should still be protected the same way before the law. If you spend money on a house, and you are currently renting it to someone, what is the difference between that and buying a house to live in? In both cases, you still spend your hard-earned money to buy the house. But, you use, but if you use one for a different reason than another, it is suddenly no longer your property, according to socialists. It does not matter what you are using your property for. If you are in ownership of it, only you can decide what to do with it, and no one can take it forcibly take it away with it or steal it from you. The distinction between personal and private property is utterly senseless, as in both cases you have received ownership of the property through trade, inheritance, or homesteading. The rational basis of property rights is the recognition that an individual needs to be able to use, consume, and control physical goods and the products of their own labor to survive and prosper. Property rights are essential to a capitalist economy as it grants the individual an exclusive right to have control over what he owns, either to consume or generate wealth. The only way that property can be exchanged is through voluntary transactions. These include rent, sales, inheritances, or charity. Property rights is crucial to not only the economy, but personal freedom as well. Property rights means that a person has self-ownership over himself, and he can do as, his, he, can do as he pleases without violating this right himself. Without self-ownership, individuals will be slaves and were not allowed to do anything by a collective entity such as the state. Recognizing that you own yourself and no one can take away that right is one of the most important doctrines, as it is the foundation of not only our civilization, but human life. Property rights are a synonym of individualism. Both ensure freedom for the individual to act and pursue their own self-interests, as long as they don't violate the property rights of others. On the other hand, in a socialist system, Property rights could be abolished, or would be abolished rather, and would be replaced with a system of common or collective property. This basically means that no one really owns anything, and property can be used by anyone, in theory. Under the system, an individual doesn't have the right to the products of their own labor, of their labor, or capital, and it will be shared among everybody. This, by all definitions, is theft as people in the community who had nothing to do with making the product or wealth get a portion of it, and the creator of the wealth only gets the same portion, even though he created the product. Under a system of common property, there is little incentive for production innovation as you don't even keep the products and wealth of your own labor. This ties in with collectivism and eco-redistribution, in that these principles are all very flawed and discourages productive behavior and encourages relying on the labor of others, Although all of this theory has more flaws than you can count, socialism is far worse than what it sounds based off the script. Since private property and keeping the profits of your actions is a and keeping the profits of your actions is a natural process, a powerful collective needs to take control of people's life and property. The most powerful and well-known group of people with the exclusive right to initiate violence and aggression on a given territory that it controls is the state socialism is not a voluntary thing as some may th as some may think you to believe it requires the use of the state to enforce it the real definition of socialism without any of that super fancy theories is when the government which is the most powerful collective entity owns the means of production 
and thus controls the actions of individuals and the economy. Next time, I will explain how socialism works in practice and why people should fear the word socialism. What is socialism and why does it fail? Part 2. Socialism in Practice Now that I have covered the theory of socialism in my latest video, what is socialism and why does it fail? Part 1. The Theory of Socialism I will now explain how socialism works in practice. To review the basics, socialism is the public ownership of the means of production, meaning that the state controls the economy. The state sets prices, wages, and determines how much of a product will be produced or if it will be produced at all. Among, along with all the other elements of an economy, such as retail trade and the creation of capital goods, such as factories, machinery, tools, and others. This, com this is compared to a market economy in which all elements of an economy are determined by market forces, such as supply and demand, and the incentive of individuals. I will explain more about the state's role in the economy later, but the thing to always remember about government ownership of the economy is that it cannot plan an economy, and thus it can produce the same results as a free market, not even close. The first example of a truly socialist country was the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, or RSFSR, which later became the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR, which included multiple republics, including Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and various others. While there have been examples of temporary period of socialist rule over a given territory, such as the Paris Commune, it was very unstable and didn't last that long. Following the chaos of the First World War and the failures of the Russian Republic to end the war and provide people with their basic necessities, the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, staged a revolution in Russia after promising the people Mir, Zimla, i Chlieb, or in English, peace, land, and bread. Lenin established the All-Russian Central Executive Committee of the Soviets, which was led by the people by the Council of the People's Commissars. The Council of the People's Commissars was the body with the highest authority over the Central Executive Co Committee, and this included powerful people such as Vladimir Lenin, the chairman, Joseph Stalin, the People's Commissioner of Nationalities, and Leon Trotsky, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, among many others. The brutal Russian Civil War was raging, and the Soviets began to implement socialist policies, such as the nationalization of all industries, state control of trade, and confiscation and redistribution of grain and other and other grown food, and the ban on private enterprise and production. Due to a policy of war communism, especially the confiscation of grain from farmers at fixed prices to evenly redistribute amongst, among the remaining population, this led to the underproduction of grain and eventually a famine. The Russian famine of 1921 to 1922 killed approximately 5 million people, and some people even had to resort to cannibalism to survive. The horrific policy of war communism ended in 1921, and the new economic policy, or NAP, began. The new economic policy would allow for private production, enterprise, trade, the free market, and capitalism, albeit state-regulated and controlled. Socialized state enterprises would also operate on a profit basis, meaning that there will be, act there will be an actual incentive for running the state enterprise. The NAP possibly save millions of lives, and without it, the RSFSR and the USSR would have likely collapsed, since the economy of the country had severely suffered and declined since 1915. The USSR was officially created on December, on, tw on the 28th of December 1922, in which the delegations from the Russian SFSR, Transcaucasian SFSR, the Ukrainian SSR, and the Belarusian SSR approved the, crea approved the treaty on the creation of the USSR. Vladimir Lenin's testament was handed over to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, calling for the restructuring of the Soviet governing system and the criticism of members such as Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky. Lenin died on the 21st of January 1924 by having a stroke and then proceeding to fall into a coma. Stalin, after the death of Lenin, took charge of the funeral when it was pe and was one of its pallbearers. Lenin's corpse was placed in a mausoleum in the Red Square of Moscow. Stalin was devoted to Leninism and created a personality cult around Lenin, renaming Petrograd to Leningrad and writing a series of books known as the Foundations of Leninism. Stalin, due to his support of the NAP, 
was called a writers by the left-wing opposition group which was created by Trotsky. The left opposition believed that the new economic policy had betrayed the ideas of communism and had conceded too much to capitalism. Gradually, the left opposition became less and less of a threat as Stalin gained more and more power. After Stalin became the supreme leader of the Communist Party, he entrusted his allies to run the Politburo and other state-run institutions. Stalin then cleared all dissent, mostly using force and creating a government institution known as the Gulag, which managed the forced labor camps set up by the order of Vladimir Lenin. Anyone who was against Stalin's change, which included the party members, was sent to forced labor camps. Eventually, millions of people passed through the Gulag systems and hundreds of thousands died due to extreme conditions and being massively overworked in the labor camp. Stalin ruled the USSR with an iron fist. Only he and his supporters were in control, and the only, and the only acceptable view was to be a supporter of Stalin. Stalin initiated his five-year plan, which planned to rapidly industrialize the Soviet Union with central planning and collective agricultural production. The collectivization of agriculture banned private farming, and thus reduced total grain production by 32%. While there were many more people in industries who, which relied on stable food production, so the procurement or purchasing of grain increased by 44%. This is very disruptive for agricultural supply and demand, as the demand for grain vastly exceeded the supply, which led to a famine in many places across the USSR. The group with the largest grain production and most complex private farming system were the Ukrainians. And this was totally shut down by Stalin, making all agricultural activities collective and everything that was produced previously under the private system will be confiscated by the Communist Party. This reduced the incentive for growing food as well as reducing the efficiency, and far less grain was produced in Ukraine that year. Meanwhile, the demand and purchase of grain was up, and enough grain simply wasn't produced to accommodate for this demand. This led to the Holodomor, also known as the Terror Famine, in which millions of Ukrainians starved to death. The Holodomor is considered an act of genocide by 16 countries and a, and a tragedy or a crime against humanity by five international organizations. However, despite the famines and millions of deaths, the Salon actually managed to industrialize the Soviet Union. The answer to the question is... sort of. Stalin did manage to industrialize the USSR, the USSR produced more capital goods such as factories, tools, and machinery, and the amount of industrial consumer goods increased, as well as more people were working for industry. However, this only happened because of the terror enforced through Stalin's rule. If you didn't work and comply, it would either be Gulag or the firing squad. In addition, workers had terrible working conditions with very low wages. One fact that is often not talked about about Stalin's five-year plan is that it needed the aid of foreign companies mostly American, to build factories and machinery. The USSR paid foreign companies to build factories and machinery with the money generated by selling grain to foreign countries. The grain came from the private farms that were robbed by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. To conclude my analysis of Stalin's five-year plan, it worked to an extent, but only with terror, famines, and oppression. If the people of a market economy had an incentive to start a wide-scale voluntary industrialization with no force required, it would be far more efficient, resulted in greater industrialization in a shorter period of time, and have no mass famines or terror killings. This is proven by the fact that Stalin's USSR hired foreign private companies because they were more efficient at building factories and machinery than the state workers. The state workers were forced to do something they didn't like, weren't good at, and the and where there was little incentive for them to work, since they could receive the same wage as someone who worked hard by doing the absolute bare minimum. Most of the workers only did the bare minimum required at their job, as they were not rewarded if they worked harder, as they did not get paid more to compensate for, for working harder. To save time, I will skip the economic policies of the Soviet Union during World War II, as it was basically just war communism version 2.0. After the death of Stalin in 1950, in, 1953, Nikita Khrushchev became the general secretary of the Communist Party and started a process of reforms known as de-Stalinization. Khrushchev was a reformist and wanted to better compete with the United States of America in the fields of space, technology, and science, and military. The USSR spent a huge amount of its money on developing ways to enter sp space, technology, and the military, and the only reason for this was not to benefit the people but was to show the United States that they were better, that the USSR was better than them. 
The Soviet people lived with only their basic needs and a horrible state-provided apartment that you possibly have to wait years for. And due to the broken feedback loop, sons and daughters would live with their parents, which they would live with their own apartment. And there would be entire families living in just a small apartment. The space and arms race were somewhat close races between the Soviets and the Americans. But, but it was only because the Soviets did it at the expense of their own citizens' lives, and the American government did not. After Khrushchev was removed and the space and arms race ended, the economy was mostly stagnant and people lived somewhat okay, but they still mostly just had their basic needs and not much else. Under Brezhnev, the economy could be, could be best described as stagnant, but relatively functional. The Soviet collapse was imminent, but was accelerated by, Gor by Gorbachev's Pristorika i Glasnos, or in English, Restructuring and Openness Policies. The USSR disintegrated on, the, on December 26, 1991, with each republic ga gaining independence. Now, moving on to China, and this will be a shorter explanation because I don't know nearly as much about China than I know about the USSR, so excuse the fact that the section is shorter. Moving on to China, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party won the Chinese Civil War and the nationalists evacuated to the island of Taiwan. Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communist Party wanted to change China from an agrarian society to an industrial one, so they wanted to create a plan similar to Stalin's five-year plan. This was called the Great Leap Forward, in which agriculture would be collectivized and private farming and production would be banned and would be replaced by people's communes. Similar issues with this existed to Stalin's five-year plan. The ban on private farming reduced the incentive and efficiency of pr food production, leading to an undersupply of food. Due to St China's very high population, it is essential to produce a lot of food through the most efficient means possible. The outlaw of private farming and the establishment of collective farming significantly reduced the economic output of agriculture, causing the Great Chinese Famine, the largest famine in history. In addition, the Four Pest Campaign exacerbated the problems of collective farming, disrupting the natural ecosystem, further reducing the amount of crops harvested. After the killing of the sparrows, also known as the Eliminate Sparrows Campaign, the Chinese Communist Party had to import sparrows from the USSR. The failures of the, of the Great Leap Forward led to economic regression, famine, mass purging, and general suffering. The only way China was able to improve economy to its modern day levels was to privatize certain services and embrace certain elements of capitalism, most specifically under Deng Xiaoping and Xi Jinping. For other socialist countries, they have a similar economic structure to the USSR and China, mostly inspired by the USSR, but with some differences. So for now, I will cease discussing about the policies of each individual country, mostly the USSR and China, and why socialism doesn't work. As I explained already, under socialism, the state controls all the elements of an economy, including prices, wages, production, the creation of capital goods, retail trade, and every other element in a functioning economy. There are several good arguments against a planned economy, but the main and best one used is the economic calculation problem. The economic calculation problem, or the ECP for short, is criticism of central of, ec of central economic planning developed by the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. Under a market economy, people's subjective values are transformed into objective information, which is the price. And the price is necessary for the rational allocation of resources within a society. Price in a market economy reflects the supply and demand for a certain good, service, or a person's labor. Since value is subjective and people desire certain things more than others, prices reflect the average value within a society. Prices are determined by a combination of various things, which include people's subjective values and personal desires, supply and demand, and the labor needed to create these products. The ECP argues that since prices are determined by individual action and values, since a market is a result of, in, of individuals acting to achieve their own self-interest, prices cannot be set by government bureaucrats. Not only does the state not have enough information to accurately set prices, but the state can never know every person's personal preferences, which are unique to every individual. The prices set under socialism, therefore, are useless. 
they do not represent the real value of a product. Without a proper price, resources cannot be allocated efficiently and resources cannot be produced as efficiently either. The lack of real market prices is one of the, re is one of the main reasons why socialism fails. Government officials cannot determine the value and preferences of every individual, therefore cannot set prices which reflect the market. The second reason for the failure of social is a lack of profits and losses. There is no way to discourage wasteful or unproductive behavior. Since the state has a monopoly over the economy under socialism, it has no competition. This means that it is not threatened by another entity and does, need it, and does not need to engage in purposeful or productive behavior. It still needs to provide enough to feed its own citizens, but it cannot, nor wants, to be as efficient as a market economy. Under a capitalist economy, or a market economy, profits are the reward for creating value and using resources efficiently to make a product. And losses is meant to be a signal of waste, and that the costs exceed the revenue because of unpurposeful, unproductive behavior or simply a miscalculation done on the owner's part of a business, for example. Under socialism, profits and losses don't exist, as the state controls all resources and property within the territory it holds. The bureaucratic individuals running the economy only use it to benefit themselves, and they don't care about creating value for the consumers. A state-run economy typically has a broken or non-existent feedback loop, meaning that the state doesn't care about the demand of consumers. This is evident by the constant shortages of consumer goods under socialism. This is because the government simply can't or doesn't even want to produce enough goods to meet the demands of the consumers. The government bureaucrats and party officials of socialism have no incentive to produce enough to meet the demands of the people. Either way, they will get to keep their total monopoly. This contrasts to a free market economy in which the only way to gain profits is to create value and supply the needs of the consumers, meaning that they willingly want to purchase your product. The final reason for socialism failing is the huge government bureaucracy. Due to the fact that the economy is planned under socialism, you need people to manage and plan the means of production, which are the bureaucrats. A new class is created under socialism, the manager and planners who plan the economy and the people who manage the planners and the, manage and the managers who manage the managers, and so on. There are many bureaucrats who contribute absolutely nothing to the society, but are still, but still by the state, they, but the state still takes resources from the economy to pay them, which could have been used to generate what people actually need. To conclude this long video, these are the key reasons why socialism fails. It lacks real market prices, doesn't have profits or losses to encourage productive behavior and discourage wasteful behavior, it doesn't have an incentive to meet the demands of the consumers, and it has a huge bureaucratic class which doesn't create any value and simply takes value from the society without producing any. I mostly discussed about the USSR, since I know the structure of it the best, but every socialist country works similarly to an extent. Before I end this video, even the socialist countries are not pure socialism. They have some private institutions. For example, in the USSR, there were f food markets in which people could freely exchange food for money, and the, and the, so, and the state allowed that. And without, for example, these food markets in the USSR, and without certain other key private institutions, the countries would simply collapse. Nobody would produce anything, there would be no incentive to produce anything, and people would simply take without producing until there's nothing left to take. The society would simply collapse and be destroyed. Next time, I will discuss socialism and America's uncertain future. Socialism is anti-American and will destroy this country if it is not stopped. Stop! Socialism! What is socialism and why does it fail? Part 3. Contemporary Socialism and the Future of America In my last video, I explained socialism in practice and the brutality, suffering, and terror it causes. Giving people a monopoly on everything, including the economy, isn't going to help anyone or make anything better. Giving certain people more power over a society or an individual and expecting them to improve the life of an individual is very naive. 
The person with more power will simply be corrupted and will destroy the life of an individual and thus the entire society for their own personal gain. A state, which is a monopoly on violence, can initiate violence without any legal consequences whatsoever and can successfully destroy the life of many people to achieve the self-interest of the individuals who run the state, something which would never be allowed or go unpunished in a voluntary free market. This contrast to a company or any other business-like entity, such as a co-op, as a company is formed through voluntary contracts and people working to receive what they need and want. The best a company can do to stay alive is to convince people to buy their product. In fact, the only way for a business to run and be incentive for the owner or owners of a business to make a profit, it needs to sell enough of its products to consumers. The only way to do this is to make a product at a price which consumers value in large enough numbers for the revenue to exceed the expenses, which are the creation of or purchasing of capital goods, rent, electricity, advertisement, management, wages for the workers, and so on. A free market, since it is based on trade and voluntary exchanges that benefit both sides, is not exploitive or unfair. Socialism can work due to denying human behavior, the rejection of subjective value in market prices, a lack of profits and losses, and the, the state having no incentive to meet the demands of the consumers, and a huge, corruptible bureaucratic class, which simply takes resources from the economy while creating no value on its own. All of these factors, along with the failure of a planned economy and the brutality of, a, of the government, cause the regression of society to any country unfortunate enough to adopt socialism. So then, why? Do so many young people in the United States sympathize with this deadly ideology? If socialism has failed everywhere it has been tried, killed and ruined the lives of millions, and set back the countries that has been implemented in for decades, why is the support for socialism only increasing? Is it out of ignorance? Is it the way socialism plays with our emotions? I believe it is partially a combination of the two reasons just stated. But the main reason for the increase of support of socialism is down to subversion. Subversion is defined as a systematic attempt to overthrow or undermine a government or political system by persons working secretly from within. Back during the Cold War, the Union, the Soviet Union, or the USSR, used a strategy of subversion to attempt to bring about crisis and demoralization in the USSA and become the dominant world power. According to the former KGB spy, Yuri Bizmianov, there are four stages of ideological subversion. The first stage, demoralization, is to educate people to reject their culture, traditions, and the principles that founded the United States, namely individual freedom and property rights. An entire generation is brainwashed and educated in the socialist and Marxist ideology. The second stage is destabilization. Diminish the old institutions, such as the free market economy, the military, foreign policy, defense systems, and progressively making them more inefficient, ineffective, and unstable, ripe for change and, social and state control. The third stage is crisis. There's a violent change of power, structure, and the economy. The government will now control all of these elements. The fourth and final stage is normalization, the period of stability which could last indefinitely until a new crisis emerges. The KGB used this plan to attempt to subvert the United States by installing Marxists in the, educating, in the education system and having Soviet spies in the US government. Despite the Soviet Union being long gone, the ideology of subversion and control is now rooted in the establishment, namely the deep state, the globalist international organizations such as the United Nations, and their subordinate puppets, such as the organizations of Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and various others. This is done in hopes of totalitarianism, and everyone working for the globalist state will receive the benefits of absolute control, whereas everyone else is a controllable pawn. In every college, public school, and educational institution, there is a Marxist or a socialist professor who teaches about the benefits of the government, social justice, and equality, and the evils of America, capitalism, and quote-unquote institutional racism and white supremacy. 
This is done to indoctrinate people and to support the ever-increasing state control and authority of politicians and bureaucrats. The modern socialist theory is orthodox Marxism, which is based on the collective and artificial class divide, but expanded to include the quote-unquote oppressed peoples based not just on class alone, but also on race, skin tone, ethnicity, nationality, and other arbitrary collective differences built on the principles of divide and conquer. This theory is called cultural Marxism, and it is destroying Western civilization as I speak. This brainwashing in public school leads to 50% of young Americans having a favorable opinion of socialism, and more than 40% of millennials preferring to live under socialism rather than capitalism. This is a problem because they are increasingly more likely to vote for government control, which leads to many problems that I will talk about later. After the fall of the Soviet Union, people cheered its collapse in Western nations, but they failed to realize the greater threat. The state or the government of Western country practice, very, practice varying degrees of socialism, and state intervention has only increased since the fall of the Soviet Union. A recent example of state intervention in the economy for the worst was when the government put a price cap on insulin, as an example. The, a price cap is simply a government imposing a private a ceiling for how, the, for how high the price of something can be, meaning that if some, something has a price cap of $35, it cannot go above that. The government capped the price of insulin to $35. Price caps don't encourage more efficient means of production. It simply reduces the quantity of that product. Since a price cap enforces a limit on how high prices can be, some companies simply cannot produce a good below that cost because their expenses would exceed their, their revenue. And if they sell that good at the maximum legal price, they would be running a deficit and thus cease production for that good. Some companies can produce a good below the price ceiling, but would produce less due to higher costs, and because they cannot receive the same profit margin they desire for that product. Due to greatly reduced supply, a shortage typically occurs after a price cap is introduced, since the demand exceeds the supplies and the item sells out and is no longer available. Price caps are typically introduced after an event, like a natural disaster or, a, or when the supply chain breaks. Under a laissez-faire free market, a disaster disrupts production and due to the increase of the demand for goods, prices rise, also called price gouging. The high, sub the high price will be a signal for companies to rapidly produce the good and with the increased profits, companies can have higher expenses to produce more goods than under a normal market. This returns the supply to the pre-disaster levels and thus lowers prices back down to their original levels. However, if a price cap was introduced in that situation, it would only exacerbate the situation. The demand for certain goods increases during a disaster, but sellers can't supply the product to combat this in increase in demand. With price gouging laws, demand would quickly overwhelm supply and it would lead to a shortage of goods. In addition, sellers do not have an incentive to produce more of these necessary goods they get the same amount of money as if it were a normal situation in which demand is much lower. The imbalance between supply, what those sellers can produce, and the demand, the interests of buyers, create shortages, leaving many people without anything during a disaster. Other issues such as extreme inflation, a housing crisis due to rent controls, the shortage of baby formula caused by government shutting down a factory, the boom-bust cycle caused by central banks, and many more issues caused by state intervention and the economy. However, curiously, almost all of these issues are blamed on the free market by socialists, and not the entity that actually created them, the government. These socialists ask for even more government regulation, which only creates more problems. Then, they blame these problems that the state created on the free market, and ask for even more government regulation. And the cycle continues, indefinitely. Socialists continue to push for the increase of government intervention because of quote-unquote social justice and equality. However, do not be fooled. State intervention and control of anything, especially the economy, will not fix any of the problems. Instead, it will create more. So, what can you, 
the viewer take away from my three-part series about socialism. Fight against socialism and government control. Do not let socialism take over in your country. Socialism finally needs to die.